I'm Ellen Klein with Sam Shriver, and this is tape two. So before we ended tape one, you were about to tell us about uh, being taken to Westerbork. But before you do that, would you back up and tell us a little bit about being in hiding? Because you were in hiding for 18 months, and that's a long time. What was that like? Um, boring, Ooh. extremely boring. Uh, you have nothing, no place to go. Mm. It was most of the time I was in, in a room in the attic. It was a decent room, but in, in the attic. Uh, so I had an, a puzzle there, a crossword puzzle, uh, a deck of cards, mm. play uh, some kind of a card game. Chance so so. Mm. It was so boring that I opened up a little window and I let a fly in mm. to have some company. And for the fly not to fly away, I pulled the wings up so it could only walk on the table where I was. And I fed it. I kept it alive. Uh, it was a very boring time. Uh, you were hearing about the war, and mm -hmm. you did hear about the invasion, mm -hmm. and that they landed in uh, in uh, France, and, mm -hmm. and, and you follow it. But there was no information from the outside. Mm -hmm. The only information we got uh, by the press was the press that was from the German, right. from the occupied, and everything was being controlled. Mm -hmm. So you didn't know, but whatever we knew is that they were on the way to liberate uh, Europe. As a matter of fact, when I got caught, they were already in Holland. Okay. But they were standing still there for about eight, nine months. Mm -hmm. okay. It was with the uh, Battle of the Bulls. Yes. And uh, they uh, were standing still in Holland for a long time. And Holland is so small. You got across to it in, uh, in, 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 in an hour, you're out of the country. Right. But they couldn't get past uh, Nijmegen and Arnhem and uh, the battles there. Oh. They were first. But uh, now the, 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 the hiding time, when I, I knew what I was safe there in the meantime. That's mm -hmm. the only thing uh, and, and taken care of. Why was that a safe space? Because I was not outside, I couldn't be caught on the street, uh -huh. and uh, I didn't go out. One uh, or twice in the evening in dark, I walked around the block, and then I said to myself, it's not worth the chances to get yeah. caught. Right. So you want to have some fresh air, then open up that little window and mm -hmm. uh, take a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I haven't been outside for uh, practically for 18 months. Mm -hmm. It's a boring time. but. In the meantime, you're, you're, you're safe. Mm -hmm. And why do you think you got caught? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I do know, but I cannot accuse anybody without having any proof. Right. I cannot accuse anybody. You want me to tell the story the way I told you before, then I will do that. Yeah. Well, I, I was looking for what he felt like the change was and what was happening there where you were hiding. And, um, do you want me to tell the story what I think? How I, I think, got caught? I think so, if you're comfortable. Uh, I was in hiding there for 18 months and food was getting scarce. Mm -hmm. There were no extra rations and coupons coming in. Mm -hmm. It was only the coupons and the rations from the people who were there living. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot accuse anybody because I have no proof. Right. Uh, we got caught, the three of us, mm -hmm. on January the 21st, 1945, 9 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. They were knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell. They came in, the Gestapo, and uh, there were three Gestapo agents there. And they uh, took us to the 
to the jail in The Hague, mm -hmm. the regular police jail, mm -hmm. where we had to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, we had to, under the control of the Dutch police, we had to walk to that very infamous jail mm -hmm. in The Hague, in Scheveningen. They used to call it the Orange Hotel because mm -hmm. Uh, orange is the color of Holland, and uh, the good uh, Dutch people only the good ones would be in there. So, uh, and uh, when we were walking there, the two policemen behind us, the three of us, and I told the two girls, I said, "This is a chance, at least for one, to be able to get away, mm -hmm. to escape." When we get to this intersection. Uh, you go right and you go left mm -hmm. and I will turn around mm -hmm. and smack those two gentlemen, those two policemen over, mm -hmm. knock them to the ground and one of us will have a chance, mm -hmm. which I did. I came to the corner and I swung around the lamp post that was on the corner there and a full speed into these two policemen, mm -hmm. knocked them over and then I started running and I did hear shooting behind me. The policeman was running after me and he was shooting and shooting and I came to a corner, a left corner, and when I came around the corner I was standing with my back against the wall mm -hmm. and ready the moment he comes around the corner I would, uh, mm -hmm. I would have him. Mm -hmm. But he was smart enough. <coughs> he was smart. He came in a big circle around the corner and he was standing with the gun in front of me. And I told him, I said, uh, it's empty, uh, you emptied out on me. Oh yeah? Try it. I said, I know it's empty. He said, well, just try it. So I didn't want to take a chance. And uh, he, under having the gun on me, he walked me back to the corner there where we were. And my sister was lying there bleeding from my leg. The policeman, and the girls didn't split up, they stayed together, they walked in one direction. So mm -hmm. the police shot one of them, uh, mm -hmm. my, my sister, in the leg, and the other girl he caught. So then we were brought into a place there, some kind of a cellar. And I gave my sister uh, first aid, put a tourniquet on her leg, mm -hmm. and uh, then other policemen came uh, with uh, heavy uh, uh, material, with uh, carabines, that is mm -hmm. uh, some kind of a rifle, that precision rifles. Mm -hmm. And they told us, OK, now try to run away. And that's when they took us walking mm -hmm. to uh, that uh, jail in, in Scheveningen there, mm -hmm. to that very infamous Gestapo jail. And I was there for 14 days. Mm -hmm and interrogated for 14 days. And after that, I was put in a boxcar, mm -hmm. like I told you before. Right. When I came into the camp, Westerborg, mm -hmm. I was must have been brought in there with a note or with, because one or two of the Gestapo who had caught me, mm -hmm was there and I was brought into uh, the office of the camp commander his name was Hemmeke and that Gestapo agent was there and I was interrogated I was standing and half a step behind me on each side was an SS mm -hmm. And the uh, camp commander, Hemmeke, he interrogated me. Mm. He had two lights, sharp lights, on my face, beams. That's how they do that. And he was asking me questions. Mm. My name and where I live and about uh, resistance and about other people in the resistance. Mm. and this. But by the very first question that he asked me, I was shrugging my shoulders. And he asked me everything in German. Now, I do happen to speak fluently German. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I 
acted as if I didn't mm -hmm. understand uh, German. So they did get a German Jew in Westerbork, mm -hmm. from the camp, to become the uh, interpreter. Mm -hmm. So now he asked me, the camp commander, the question. Mm -hmm. So the question he asked me in German, now I look at mm -hmm. the interpreter, he has to, train, but in the meantime it gives me time to think. Right. That was the whole idea. Mm -hmm. So every question was, uh, what's your name, and where did you live, and uh, uh, other uh, resistance fighters, mm -hmm. and uh, people in hiding, and of course I don't answer enough of these questions. And at all the time it goes to the interpreter, and I was waiting for him to translate it. Uh -huh. And then the camp commander asked me a question in German, wo sind deine Eltern? That means, where are your parents? Mm. And I did not wait for the interpreter to mm. translate it, and I got right back at the uh, mm. camp commander, and I said, I'd like to ask you that question, where my elders are. Mm. They were here once. Where are my parents? No, that did it, of course, and I was put in solitaire for three days, and water and bread only, and uh, but I didn't let anything out, of course. I didn't give him any. No so he was embarrassed? Well, I don't care whether he was embarrassed. I didn't. Uh, well, uh, I, I couldn't hold back at that time when he mm -hmm. asked me. He felt, of course, that it made a fool out of him. Right. Well, it's too bad. Too bad. And then, uh, then I was put in. in a work commando where you had to do batteries. Okay. Uh, in Holland, if you want to buy new batteries, you had to, uh, to bring in the old batteries. I mean, the regular mm -hmm. uh, uh, flashlight batteries. Mm -hmm. And uh, so over all of Holland, uh, thousands, hundred thousands of these batteries mm -hmm. were being delivered, uh, uh, being brought in. And they came to Westerbork. And what we had to do there, we had to uh, 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 take them completely apart. Mm -hmm. And there was one machine that you had to put it in, and you had to give it a kick, and it opened and it cut the battery in two. Now, these batteries, when you cut them open and they split, then you have on the outside, you have paper. Okay. And, oh, I know them so well. I did thousands of them. And paper that went in the garbage can, mm. and then the sink went in this can, and then there was a lead stiff inside, and you had to cut that off. Uh, the tip was copper, so the stiff goes there, that's lead, and there goes the copper, and then there was leftover brown coal. Okay. But that was on gauze, on some kind of a gauze. Mm -hmm. And you had to get that off the gauze. And you had to do that with your fingers because mm -hmm. they don't give you uh, 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 tools because mm. a tool becomes a weapon. Mm. And you had to do that with your fingers. And I, I've done that for all the time that I was there in the punishment barrack. And I had an ID card, especially with an S on it. S in Dutch means straf, and also in, in German, gestraft. And whenever an, an SS officer would ask me for my ID card, mm -hmm. and he sees an S on it, they had special treatment. Mm -hmm. In the barracks, where I was peeling off the brown coal, which was stuck on that uh, battery, my hands, my fingers, my thumbs were bleeding. All the, 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 the flesh was out of my thumb because mm. I can do something here with my finger that mm. normal people cannot do. Look, you mm. get a whole dent in it. All that flesh on, on both thumbs are, are gone. Here, mm. I pushed it in. Look here, there's nothing there. Because mm. it's so caustic, right? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. com completely uh, the flesh was gone. And after I was in the punishment barracks, I got later on in the, in the, in the regular camp. And were, were Clara and your sister also there at Westerbork? Were they transported to Clara the Clara was there, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't see them. I okay. haven't seen them at all, till after the war. Mm -hmm. 
I haven't seen them. But the reason that I am going now to schools and to colleges, universities, mm -hmm. and uh, high schools to speak to young people, because young people have to know what happened for their own protection. Right. So I do that because I have a legacy to do that. Right. A legacy. And I have six million reasons. Mm -hmm. The six million reasons are the six million Jews who died in the concentration camps. Six million Jews who died. Among the six million Jews, a million and a half children. Mm. Million and a half. And I ask myself so very often, from the million and a half children who died, maybe today there could have been a genius like there have been so many geniuses among Jewish people. Einstein, uh, take for instance and Dr. Uh, Jonas Salk. Maybe it's not even known by a lot of people. Dr. Jonas Salk in the 50s, mm -hmm. 1950s, came out with the polio vaccine. Right. Today, young people don't even know what polio is. Right. There has been so many Jewish geniuses in, in literature, in music, mm -hmm. in, 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 in every, every aspect. And, and I ask myself so very often, from the million half children who died, mm -hmm. got killed, murdered, mm -hmm. slaughtered, maybe today there could have been another genius who could have found a cure for today's sicknesses, lung, heart, cancer, AIDS, mm -hmm. no, no, they killed a million and a half kids, not for what they've done, no, 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 for what they were, mm -hmm. Jewish, six million Jews in total, also got killed uh, five million non-Jews, mm -hmm. like homosexuals, uh, 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 gypsies, uh, <coughs> like uh, political prisoners, mm -hmm. uh, invalid people. Hitler mm -hmm. killed his own invalid, mm -hmm. non-Jewish people. Mm -hmm. He wanted a pure race, mm -hmm. a pure race. He killed his own non-Jewish invalid people because he wanted a pure race, blonde hair and blue eyes. And that's something that, that, that I don't understand. Himself, he had dark hair mm -hmm. and dark eyes. And, then I, I, and that's still unbelievable for me. And that's why I, I never understand that. Uh, tell me, go back though and tell me more about being in Westerbork. Tell me about how you survived in Westerbork and well, who you helped in Westerbork. Uh, and how you escaped. No, I, I, I didn't get no help in Westerbork. I helped myself. Everybody was on his own. Mm -hmm. And because of my attitude, mm -hmm. because if it comes to a point, <coughs> I have a very bad attitude. If it comes to survival, mm -hmm. not in regular life, but in survival. Mm -hmm. I, food didn't get, uh, didn't get no gourmet. Uh, mm -hmm. that, it wasn't very bad because they kept Westerbork at a low key. Uh, there were no numbers in the, on the arms given in Westerbork either because Westerbork was still in Holland. Mm -hmm. They didn't want any suspicion mm -hmm. that 3,000 miles of, uh, kilometers away mm -hmm. from Westerbork in Poland, people got put in the gas chamber and mm -hmm. killed and slaughtered. Mm -hmm. So they kept it at a pretty low key. The food was... Uh, you could just live on it, you didn't die from it, uh, you didn't get no uh, stomach problem from eating too much, but mm -hmm. uh, it was not too bad. But for me it wasn't enough because I, uh, I was always hungry, hungry. Mm -hmm. So one day I took my little uh, pen, nap that I had there, and uh, I went to the uh, Gestapo kitchen. Mm -hmm. And there was a uh, cook there, and I went to one of those pots that were right on the stove, opened it up, and it starts scooping out. And uh, I think either he kills me or what, what, what the hell can happen to me? I'm hungry here. I didn't know what the hell it's going to be all together anyway. So, uh, and he said to me in German, what are you doing there? You know, if they see you here, then I could get to, I think, ah, I got the right guy here. He's afraid that he's going to get, if they see me here, I said, I will be coming here every day. I'm hungry. You guys are eating. I got to eat too. 
don't you come back. I said, here's what I do. Uh, this pan here, I will put every day right there under the barrack. If there's no food in there, I will come. I had every day I had food. Every day. Besides other things that I stole. Mm -hmm. And I came out, I was pretty, uh, I was well built. Mm -hmm. I didn't have no hunger. Mm -hmm. Listen, for survival you do anything. Right. And then they come, and then I'm a, a guy, I go to everything. I go to the wall if I have to. Mm -hmm. And how did, how did you escape from Westerbork? Because I know that you escaped. We could hear the sound of, well, first I'd like to tell you something else. Okay. I'd like to tell you that in Westerbork, Two Westerbork came 110,000 Jews. Okay. There were in Holland before the war 140,000 Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And from the 140,000, 110,000 got caught mm. and taken to Westerbork. From Westerbork, they were sent to the dead camps in Poland, mm. of which from the 110,000, less than 2% came back. About two, three thousand came back. That's all. Mm -hmm. When the camps were liberated, from the hundred and ten thousand who were taken away into the dead camps, are uh, also my parents. And uh, let me put it different. Uh, for the two set, from the two sets of grandparents, my father was one of the fourteen, mm -hmm. and my mother was one of the five children. That means from the two sets of grandparents were 19 children, married, 38 uncles and aunts. Mm. I have family. never been able to count how many cousins I had. After the war, there was one uncle, one aunt left. Mm. Cousins, less than fingers of one of my hands. Mm. They killed all my relatives, my friends, my neighbors, my schoolmates, my everybody I knew, everybody, including my parents. After the war, I was an, an, an orphan without parents. You gotta make a life for yourself. You gotta see that you get there. You know, when I go to school, I ask, so very often I ask the kids, what is the worst disease? You know, when I give lectures. Mm -hmm. What is the worst disease that has killed more people than any of the diseases that has been combined in the world? And they put up their hands and they come with uh, AIDS and cancer and heart mm -hmm. trouble and, and, and the plague and, and, and no, 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 mm. no, no. The worst disease that has killed more people than any, any of the diseases that are combined in the world mm -hmm. is discrimination. Mm -hmm. Discrimination has killed more people than anything else in the whole world. Discrimination is deadly. Discrimination is the worst thing there is. And I tell these kids in school, don't you ever, ever discriminate. Not against race, religion, nationality, or color of skin. If it comes to color of skin, I'm colorblind. I don't know any color. I only know good or bad. Yeah. The bad ones I don't associate with. Yeah. Don't you ever discriminate. Because if you discriminate, you start a next Holocaust. Because that's how it all started, yeah. with discrimination, right. hate, bigotry. That's the worst thing there is in the world. Don't you ever, ever discriminate or hate. Mm. Scrap hate out mm. completely. So what happened? Go back again for me, though, to Western. Uh, How did you get back, out? Uh, we could hear the thundering of the artillery fire mm -hmm. coming closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And we knew that any day we could be liberated, mm -hmm. any day. And we had to work from sun up till sundown, mm -hmm. every day. And I said to my body, you know, pretty soon we will be free. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the day, we had to stop working. Mm -hmm. Around 12, one o'clock. Mm -hmm. What day was this? Do you remember? That was on April the 11th. Okay. Yeah. We had to stop uh, at 45. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. April 11, 45. Okay. 1945. Everybody in the barracks, mm -hmm. don't come out. If you come out of the barracks from the mm -hmm. towers, you get shot. Mm -hmm. I said to my buddy, I don't trust that. That I don't trust. If the Allied forces are coming closer and closer, the guards are going to run away. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do with all the people in the barracks before they run away? Mm -hmm. They can come in with a machine gun and mow us all down. Mm -hmm. I said, we're going to escape tonight. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get shot from the towers, my buddy said, and I don't want to be, I said, well, if you don't go, then I go by myself. I'm not going to be a sitting duck. Mm -hmm. When it got a little dark, I crawled on my stomach out of the barrack, okay. ducked myself into a garbage dump, mm -hmm. put a box over my head and a hole in it to be able to breathe. When it was completely dark in a corner from the camp, I escaped. And under the barbed wire, mm -hmm. because in Westport uh, uh, the barbed wire was not under uh, electric power. Mm -hmm. And I escaped. I started walking in the dark through the woods for hours in the direction of the noise of the artillery fire. Okay. Then I got between in the two fighting armies. Okay. Bullets were flying all around. I got to a canal mm -hmm. and I want to s swim across, across the canal so I undressed and I had my clothes mm -hmm. a little above water and I swam across the canal when I came out on the other side I had a rifle butt on my head. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, those Germans, they got me again, but I did hear foreign language being speaking. I think, ah, that's it, I'm free. No, they took me into custody. Who was it? There was a brigadier general, that mm -hmm. name I found out later on, mm -hmm. of course. At that time I didn't know. There was a brigadier general uh, and he claimed that by an interpreter, because I didn't speak no English at that time, mm -hmm. he claimed that I was a collaborator with the Nazis. I said, I'm an escapee from Westerbork concentration camp. That is, I don't know, I walked through the night, four miles, five miles, I don't know, away from the camp you're talking about, that's now going with the interpreter back and forth. The, the camp you're talking about are military barracks, German military barracks. We have seen from reconnaissance planes yesterday who took the pictures, only military, I said sure, because we were kept in the barracks, we were not allowed to go out. No, you're lying, it's not true, the military barracks, and we're going to bombard it and flatten it with artillery fire. So I said to the Brigadier General, if you do so, I told you right now that there is being kept about close to a thousand Jewish people there. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that, then I'm going to hold you responsible after the war for killing right. thousand innocent people. I told you so. Right. He looked a little different at me. He said, are you willing to go back with a six-man patrol. I said, sure, give me some uh, firing power. I said, I'm not going back in German territory without uh, being armed. No, we don't arm civilians. I said, well, that's too bad, then I'm not going back, but, and I'm still only responsible. So then he changed his mind. He gave me a stand gun with several uh, rounds of ammunition, and then we had to start walking. I was walking between two military men who were um, half a step or a step behind me and four in the back and the interpreter and they had the order I was told that the moment they make a wrong move to kill me. We run into stiff German SS and collaborators uh, from the German side, mm -hmm. and we had to eliminate them. We started to fight these men, and uh, they found out very fast on whose side I was. And uh, we eliminated these guys. We didn't lose any of our own men, mm -hmm. and we continued to walk. And it got just a little bit daylight when we got to the camp. Mm -hmm. The gate was open. The guards had run away already, and everybody was still in the barracks. Mm -hmm because it was still, uh, it just started to get uh, twilight. Oh, Don, what do you call it? Uh, early in the morning, that mm -hmm. it just started to get uh, bright light. 
and there was one man with us with a field radio. Mm -hmm. He radioed back to his command that, that it, uh, it's true, but I told it's a camp with the prisoners and mm -hmm. an hour and a half later, the Canadian Armed Forces rolled into the camp. The Brigadier General was there too, mm. and a big man, giant big man. He came over to me and all he said in his very heavy voice, Oh, you were right. And that's all he said, because he had to continue to liberate the rest of the country. Mm. And that was the end of that story. But 22 years later, mm. when I <coughs> immigrated to Canada, in the meantime, uh, I worked in Canada first, and then in 1954, I immigrated to Canada. And on Armistice Day, 1967, I always go to uh, Dominion Square in, uh, in Montreal, Canada, where I live now. And I uh, put to commemorate the soldiers who died, mm -hmm. the people who died in the Holocaust, soldiers in the First World War, the Second World War, mm -hmm. and all these. And there is the uh, mayor of the town speaking, and a priest was speaking, and a rabbi is speaking, and the military man is speaking. And I look at that man, I think, I, I, I've seen you before. But it's a big man with lots of medals, all full with medals there. And uh, I think I've seen, I think, that is the Brigadier General from 22 years ago. I mean, wait, when he's finished, I go over to see him. He was finished, he comes down the podium there, and I started to walk over to him. Before I knew it, I was hanging in the air. Mm -hmm. Two big military policemen who was guarding him. Mm -hmm. They kept me. As a matter of fact, as I met one uh, in Montreal later on in life, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of these military policemen. And, and I yelled at the uh, British general. In the meantime, he became the chief of staff, the highest mm -hmm. in command of Canada. And I go, uh, I said, uh, don't, uh, don't you recognize me? Who? Holland, Westerborg. And he looked at me. He said, you're the boy who swam across the canal. You're right. He said, let him go, let him go. Anyway, I marched through the city. I marched with him. And after, uh, we became good friends. Uh, Every Armistice Day we were together. As a matter of fact, I have pictures that I can show you on, on, on that. I will show you that later on. And uh, we got together every Armistice Day and uh, lunch with the wife. And uh, he became a good friend of mine. And uh, he passed away in 1993. But I never talked about this year. How did I get to talk about it after 48 years? Yeah, because for 48 that. years, I mm -hmm. didn't <coughs> talk about anything, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. but only I started to talk to combat mm -hmm. the Holocaust deniers. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I started to talk in schools and at the Holocaust Museum, Florida Holocaust Museum in mm -hmm. uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, I had kids asking me questions. Mm -hmm. And they said, Sam, uh, you were talking about that you were in Westerbork, but you didn't say how you were liberated, how you came out of it. And mm -hmm. that's how that story came out I with see. the Brigadier General. And uh, that later on he became, uh, and there was a journalist in the audience there, and he came over to me after. He said, uh, could I interview you? I said, well, what do you like to know? And he asked me about the story and everything. And before I knew it, uh, it was in uh, the St. Pete Times, mm -hmm. on the front page with pictures and the whole thing. And then it uh, came into the Tampa Tribune. Mm -hmm. I was asked to be on television mm -hmm. and talk radio and uh, all these things. And uh, before I knew it, it blew over to Montreal, Canada. Okay. And when I came back in Canada, a journalist came to me from the uh, Montreal Gazette and uh, phoned me, can I come over to your house to interview? And they came to the house and uh, before I knew it, I was on the front page with my story and the picture. I got a call from the Consul General of the Netherlands 
and he asked me to come and see him. Uh, anyway, I came there and he asked me about the story. I told him the story and about a while later, and that was in 2000, yeah, plain 2000. In 2000, I, my wife got a call, it was kept secret, to bring me to the consulate. And when I came there, uh, there were about 130 people there. Mm -hmm. There were ambassadors there and consul generals of all the various countries were there. And I didn't know what that was going on. And then all of a sudden, I was called to come by the consul general out of the audience there and he uh, before I knew then he had reported it to the royalty in Holland yeah. to the Queen of Holland and uh, then uh, he told the story to the audience there and the whole thing what happened and for having saved the lives of later on I was told uh, the real about 870 mm -hmm. Jewish people in the concentration camp I was given this medal, I was knighted by the Queen of Holland. That was the story with the Brigadier General there. Beautiful. I will show you a picture later on of the Brigadier okay. General. Good, good. So what did you do after the war, before you immigrated? When you were uh, there at the camp, the camp had been liberated, what happened after that? Uh, when the camp was liberated, they started right away to bring in Dutch Nazis uh -huh. and German SS. Mm -hmm. okay. And now I became the guard oh, okay. in I Westerbork. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not allowed to go. Um, anyway, we couldn't go back to our cities yet because Holland wasn't completely liberated. The northern okay. part uh, and uh, eastern part of Holland was liberated, but mm -hmm. not the west. Okay. And that still uh, took uh, quite a while. So uh, everybody had to stay in the camp, but in the meantime, uh, they brought in Dutch Nazis and mm -hmm. uh, German military uh, SS. And then I became the guard. Mm -hmm. What was that like, to switch roles like that? What was it like? It's, it's very difficult even to, 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 to express myself about it. Yet you haven't got a feeling now I am in charge. No, you, you, you try to get back what has been done to you. And you can never, never, never get back what they did to you and what they have done to you. Uh, bodily, uh, mentally, uh, in, in every respect. Mm -hmm. I was a guard there for uh, from 19, from the liberation that was on the April 12th, mm -hmm. 1945. Mm -hmm. I was a guard there till June the 22nd. So okay. that's a good two months. Mm -hmm. I tried to get back, but you can't get back what they did to you. And then it was taken over by the Dutch uh, government later on, who uh, and my, all these people that never and all those Dutch collaborators. Holland had per capita mm. compared to other countries who were occupied occupied mm -hmm. by German mm -hmm. by Germany. Holland had the most collaborators of all of the other occupied countries. Why do you think that is? Uh, because they, they, uh, they collaborated with them. Mm -hmm. uh, poor people, they were promised you get this, you get that, you get bread, you get wine, you get here, you get that, your children get this, that, that. And, and, and some are the being sim uh, sim sympathetic to them. Uh, mm -hmm. they, 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 it, it, there were so many collaborators in Holland, it's known for it. it it's, it it's statistics, uh, you mm -hmm. can look it up. Holland had the most collaborators of all of the Nazis mm -hmm. occupied territories, most of them. And so we got an offer. But all these 
hundreds of thousands of people. You can now all put them in jail. So, right. and the same thing in uh, Germany uh, and, and the concentration camps and all mm -hmm. the ones who killed all the people. Mm -hmm. They didn't get anything. But I could never, never understand. But I could never understand. What a mentality. And I've seen pictures. I've seen so many, many, many things. These, I cannot find the right word for these people who, who, who did the killing. Mm. How could they go on Christmas home mm. to the wife and the children and bring them some toys for the kids or a doll for their own kids and play with their own kids while they were killing millions of children themselves, Jewish mm -hmm. kids. I never understood that mentality, how, how they could just... Uh, they, they, in, uh, in the concentration camps, uh, they are getting get, uh, get together with, with their own uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, having their parties and singing and dancing and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they were beasts. They were beasts. Uh, I never could uh, understand that. I, will I still will never be able to understand. I will never be able to comprehend. I will never be able to find peace. Just to think what happened. Because I have so very often after I've been speaking, people coming over to me and uh, they say, uh, oh, you know, uh, I can imagine. And I said, no, you can't. You can't. It's imaginable. As a matter of fact, when it gets to talk about it, uh, and you will find the words, it, it was very bad. It was, was, uh, you cannot find the word. I made a word myself. I made a word because there is, as you said, it was atrocious, it was deep. No, no. It was unbeclumicable. There has to be a new word for what the, the Holocaust was mm -hmm. because there isn't a word in the whole dictionary. Mm -hmm. It was really unbeclumicable. Unbeclumicable. And I know the word, what it means. That is the, the, the worst that has ever been in, in, in the world. Unbeclumicable. And that about people. I still don't understand. I still don't understand. One crazy man, Hitler. There were millions who followed him. Those highly, 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 highly intelligent German, because these German, I'm not talking before the war. I'm only talking before the war. Mm -hmm. If you wanted your children, the countries around Germany, if you want your children to have a good education, mm -hmm. you send them to Germany, the school in there. Mm -hmm. They were the best in anything and everything, scientists, physicists, in, in, in literature, in, 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 in arts, in, 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 in tool making, in, in furniture making, in, 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 in you name it, in anything and everything they were the best. And that these highly, highly intelligent people, that they have lent themselves to do what they have done, yeah. to follow a madman and kill 11 million people, not for what they had done, but for what they were. Mm. I cannot find the word for it, but, but, but it's, that's unbeclumical. I will never be able to find peace with that. Never. Never, ever. Never. 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 Still up till today. I cannot. I don't want to go very deep in my mind about what happened and what I have lost because I'm afraid I would go bananas. I really don't want to, to take stock go really deep, deep into it, and I've never done it. And I don't want to because I know myself. I would go okay. berserk. I would smash everything around me to pieces. Mm. I don't want to go deep into it because it has really been unbeclumicable. Okay. You did some very wonderful things after the war. You want to tell me about those? Well, after the war, when I came out of it after the war, 
I was alone. Mm. My parents didn't come back. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to do. I, I haven't got any recollection of the first six months. I, I don't know how I have been living. I don't know for what I have been living. I know only one thing that I had no direction where to go or what to do because I was going to, to the Red Cross okay. who were getting the names of the people who were coming back from the concentration camps, mm -hmm. looking at the list. They find people in here and there, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, they find them here and there, some people, and I found one friend of mine, Harry Goldberg, uh, body, bosom body, lived in, in my, my own street, and we were friends for years. Um, he was in, in Davos, in Switzerland, because he came out of the camp with the, uh, tuberculosis. And Davos is the best place in Switzerland. So they send them there for to getting uh, cured and better. And I, I, I was going there every day to the Red Cross for months to see relatives coming back or did a name on it, a name. Mm -hmm. And after a month and two months and three months and then after Six months I had to give up. I didn't see the names of my parents or any other relatives. Mm -hmm. There was one aunt. And I had to give up. And one day at home, at home, I was living in a, in a room. I walked into the bathroom and I see that guy in the mirror. And I didn't like what I saw. I didn't like the guy, the way he looked. And I told that guy that if you don't take care of yourself, then you're going to go under. So either, what do you want? You want to live or you want to die, make an end of it and be gone or do something. And what I did was I started to get a job and that was with, at that time, with Harsha and Alia, and I said, hey, yeah, let. Mm. And I went to school in the evening and uh, study at night. At three o'clock, my head fell on the table, but at seven o'clock, up again, and mm. I got my BA, and I, I did very well, and I took care of myself. And I worked for Harsha and Alia. Harsha and Alia was, Harsha is for the preparing mm -hmm. of the Alia for Jewish people to Israel. Right. And who wants to go to Israel after the war? People who were alone or had nothing or nobody. Right. But there were also children who were given during the war mm -hmm. by Jewish people into hiding. Right. Take my child and after the war to get it back. But a lot of these people did not come back mm -hmm. and the child was with Gentile people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these Gentile people after the war came forward and they went to the Jewish community and said, I have here a child and the original name is so-and-so, and gave them back to the community. But an awful lot did not give the children back, which I understand. They had the kids, let's say, for two years, three years. Right. You get to love the child. Some had them from babies on. Some had them when the kid was eight years. I, I have a, a cousin, he was from his eight till his 11 year. Uh, uh, the, and they get to love that uh, kid. But hey, hey, hey. We lost so many after the war. We were left over from 140,000 to 25,000 Jewish people in Holland. We like to get as many as possible back in the community to build it up again. So I went around for Harsha and Alia to in, in Holland, visiting villages and little towns, 
because most of these kids were uh, in hiding uh, with the farmers or with the little uh, uh, villages and and to find these kids. And now, how do you find a Jewish child? You know, that's... Uh, so I went to playgrounds and I went to school playgrounds. And there is a recess. And during the recess, you see those kids play. And there's kids, and there's one kid there saying, you stand here and you do that and we do it. That was the Jewish job. <laughs> because we are leaders. We are leaders. They cannot take that away from us. Mm -hmm. We are leaders and we are so order givers. So that has to be a Jewish child. So when that kid came out of school, I went over to him. Now in the olden days, you could start up with kids and they uh, were, were, were but today, you tell your children not to talk to strangers, but right. not in the olden days. And when I went over to that boy when he came out of school, mm -hmm. and I said, hi, I want to talk to you. And he said to me, I'm not talking to strangers. That gave me the confirmation, right. you are <coughs> a Jewish boy. And besides that, I knew it. I knew it. I felt it. So next time, a couple of weeks later, I followed him to his home. And I went to the parents, and I told the parents what I thought. They said no, and they showed me a birth certificate. I said, very nice, I'm a forger too. And I used to forge IDs and passports and all these mm -hmm. things for Jewish people to try to get out of uh, Holland during the war, mm -hmm. to Spain, Portugal, uh, or, or Switzerland. I said, uh, that, that said, no, it's here, it's official, did, and then, uh, and they didn't give in. And then, it, Later on again, I went again to the school, and he came out of the school, and uh, he didn't want, I said, no, I, don't, I know you don't want to talk to me. I just saw you and say alone because I'm going to the Goldbergs here mm -hmm. in town. I said, they invited me, we're going to have a nice meal, we're going to have the dish and potato uh, latkes, and we're going to have knishes. He said, knishes? I said, what do you know about knishes? <laughs> and that's how he felt to the uh, and uh, then I went to the parents, there was so and so and so on. But I found an awful lot of these kids, and we put them in a home okay. with very good care, and with uh, schooling and mm -hmm. students, and we had uh, shaliachs coming from mm -hmm. uh, Israel, right. teachers, mm -hmm. to teach them in the meantime uh, the, the language. And when uh, the day came there when the state of Israel was proclamated, mm -hmm. these kids, if we couldn't find uh, parents, uncles, aunts, uh, any relatives, then these kids were uh, taken to uh, with their, okay, mm -hmm. and somewhere too young even to, and uh, to, to Israel. Mm -hmm. I have hundreds of kids living in Israel, my kids, hundreds of them. I would go to Israel and they would know what become me there then. Uh, I have pictures in Montreal of these homes that I'm um, with these kids. It was a, that I, I think, and I, I had a good life, aside from the Holocaust, but I think that those three years, mm. Arsha and Alia, and Le that mm. means for the help to the children, right. I think those three years were the most wonderful years of my life. Mm. And as a matter of fact, my wife remembers because we were just girlfriend and boy going mm. out together. Um, I used to bring adults to, from Holland to Marseille to the Exodus ships. Okay. And one day I had an, a double big truck with, with a big trailer behind it all with arms and ammunition and, and <coughs> excuse me, that I took to uh, Marseille and she said, and came to say goodbye to me. These three years from 1945 till 1948, mm -hmm. till the state of Israel was proclamated, were the most wonderful years of my life. That was just I had uh, everything. 
I had uh, black Jewish kids. I had blonde ones from Norway, Sweden. I had Chinese Jewish kids. And the beauty of everything is, they speak a different language. And with your hand and your feet, and you had a conversation with them. I don't know what it is, but you could always talk with them. With your hand and your feet, and you got there. These three years were the most, most beautiful years of my life. Oh, my beautiful. Beautiful. So we're coming to the end of the second tape. And if it's okay, we'll stop here. And then okay. will you tell us some more? Okay. <laughs>